Hey everyone, there's 20 of, 21 of you logged in. So thanks everyone for logging in. This is uh, Dr. Mahita. He's kind enough to take some vacation time to come and teach us. So, um, so uh, I guess we'll get started. All right, I um, guess. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris. I'm one of the cardiology fellows uh, uh, today. One of the things I wanted to talk about is it's a really kind of simple talk. Uh, it should usually only takes like 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, it's essentially I'm going to focus on cardiogenic shock, but it's shock in general and attack wing shock. And the nidus of this talk is born from, you know, if you haven't experienced yet, most of the senior residents have. But really, this is kind of focused for the interns who are going to make that jump to the ICU next year. Because okay. I know most of your ICU experience here is over at the VA. Um, where it's, it's a little different uh, in the ICU settings over here, both CVICU and the NICU. Um, one of the things that you will experience is, especially when you're you know fresh new resident in the ICU, is uh, realistically the ICU nurses, they, they kind of know more than you at that point. That's the way it is for everyone. And one of the things I always remembered is uh, a patient would be crashing or something would be going on, and the ICU nurse would come to me and say, like, hey, what do you want to do? And I would kind of freak out and in my head and think, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? And this was one of the things that uh, helped me really kind of just think through that and approach shock and really the ways to manage it. Because it's really actually, frankly, quite simple. This talk comes from, there's a gentleman named Jeff Weiss, who uh, it, I think this year you guys didn't go. Gene, Gene I see he was recognizing, there's a conference APDIM is the chief resident conference. And I know Javi Baez was there because uh, I, I was there with him. Um, a couple of years back, and Jeff Weiss does this talk, and he has a book that if you're looking for uh, a book as if you're becoming a chief, uh, it's called Teaching in the Hospital, or if you're an intern becoming a, a resident, or if you're a med student becoming as an intern, uh, Jeff Weiss Teaching in the Hospital, he does, I think, 10 different equations that you need for internal medicine, and I, I actually use all of them, uh, so I, I really like it, but so we'll get started, and we're going to focus on cardiogenic shock, but we're going to really highlight all of the shocks very briefly and then really kind of stick to cardiogenic. And so the equation you can see here, and you've seen it a million times before, is just mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And since we're talking about cardiogenic shock, we're going to break down cardiac output into stroke volume, heart rate, and then further we're going to break stroke volume into preload and contract filling. And so the reason why I go over this equation first in when Jeff Weiss does the talk, he goes over this way is because there's really only four variables that we're tackling when we talk about shock. You know, there's all these fancy things we talk about with treating patients on shock, but it really boils down to just four things. Their vascular resistance, their heart rate, their contractility, and their preload. And even simpler than that, very rarely do we actually tackle the heart rate. We're actually using interventions for preload contractility and systemic vascular resistance. So whenever I get a patient, I plug them into this equation in my mind and think, where do I got to go? So we'll briefly touch on hypovolemic and septic first, um, because I'm going to spend the most time on cardiogenic. So hypovolemic, we'll get right off the bat, right out of the way. It's the simplest one. So when you look at your mean arterial pressure equation here, you know that systemic vascular resistance shouldn't be a pro problem. It could be plus or minus. Where's my marker grab at? That's all right. So systemic vascular resistance is going to be plus or minus. It may be up, it may be down. Typically, if someone's hypovolemic, it's going to be up. Um, that's all right. Heart rate, generally, if someone's hypovolemic, they're going to be quite tachycardic. So that's going to be up as well. So then really, we're looking at preloaded contractility. Assuming a normal, normal heart's not someone who had baseline um, cardiac dysfunction to start with. Uh, so assuming that was all normal, so SPR is probably going to be up, heart rate is going to be up. And so assuming that their heart is normal, you know, say this is just someone who had a hemorrhagic shock, you got a young patient who is in a traumatic accident and they blood out a lot, their contractility is actually going to be up. Their heart's going to be in a hyperdynamic state. So the only thing that's going to be down is their preload. So hypovolemic is by far the easiest. You just address their preload. And that's why you'll see so many of the different uh, interventions that we do, especially even if someone comes in septic, the first thing we do is tank them up. We give them volume back. 
specifically if they're hemorrhagic, you give them blood back. So, so we won't spend that. That's literally all the time we're going to spend on hypovolemic because it is definitely the most straightforward. Give them volume back. So septic. And the reason why I like to go over all of them is because I want to show how they differ from cardiogenic. Um, septic is, or distributed shock, you know, is a state where the patient's blood vessels are now too leaky. They're dilated, they're expanded, fluid is leaking out of their intravascular space into the third space, the tissue. And that's really the nidus of what's wrong with them. They can't keep their pressures up because they're leaking so much in third space and so much volume. And that's because their systemic vascular resistance is very down. Heart rate, again, can be variable, but in general, your septic patients are going to be more tachycardic. And then we go back to preload and contractility here. So contractility, again, similar to hemorrhagic, assuming they have normal native cardiac function, this isn't a mixed track, you're going to have increased contractility. The heart's going to be trying to work harder to overcome the low preload state to maintain the cardiac output. Your preload is going to be down because you third spaced, and now your actual intravascular volume is down where your third space volume is increasing because you're leaking everywhere. So, in septic patients, that's why the first thing we address is preload first. So, you're going to give them fluid first. And then the next thing, if you can maintain them with just fluid, we know that all of the pressors that we use are not benign. And so, if you can maintain them with just fluid and get your adequate mean arterial pressure, then you can hold off the pressors, but then after you've tanked them up, if you're still seeing hypoperfusion, your urine output's down, then you're going to add on a presser to address their systemic vascular resistance. So that's all the time I'm going to spend on those. Now we're going to focus on cardiogen. And one thing just to go back to is we talk about being. arterial pressure and really focus on that. And we say for sepsis, we want to map 65. For cardiogenic shock, we say 60 to 70 map. And really one of the big things is your maps can be variable in these patients. So you don't necessarily want to drive them based off of the map. What I like to see is the effective end organ perfusion. So if I see that you know their transaminases are coming down, if I see that you know neurologically they're getting better perfusion of the brain, the big one is kidneys. If I see that they're making adequate urine output, and I won't necessarily be really harping on the map. So one of the big things you can go by is making sure you're getting your accurate, accurate urine output. So now we're going to spend some time on cardiogenic. So as we went through with hypovolemic and septic, let's go through the actual map equation and actually see what we're tackling. So cardiogenic, the problem we know, we're going to go backwards actually, is contract telling. So we know this is a problem with contract telling. Someone had a big heart attack. Someone has Takotsubo. Uh, you know, focal myocarditis, fulminant myocarditis, and now the heart's just not squeezing. So your contractility is way, way down. In general, as you guys have seen, when our patients come in, the, the cardiogenic shock patients, preload and volume is not the issue. These are patients who have really, really weak hearts. Their EF is down, and they're waterlogged. You know, fluids backing up in their lungs, backing up in the right side of their heart, into their systemic vasculature. And so you know that preload is very, very out of these patients. So you have a state of low contractility, you have a state of low, a high preload. Heart rate again can be very variable. You could have cardiogenic shock because you have a low heart rate. We take that out of the equation. Say you get someone who has a junctional rhythm that's super low or a complete heart block or something, then they can definitely get water low because they back up because they're not able to just generate the heart rate they need. So heart rate plus or minus. General, in general, we generally see these patients tachycardic, but it could be the other way. Now, the big one is systemic vascular resistance. Now, here's where we differ from septic, because the problem that we're tackling is now you have a body that's recognized that my cardiac output is really low. So what does the body do? It knows it needs to maintain a map. It wants to make those kidneys happy. So it in turn jacks up the systemic vascular resistance. So now your SVR is way, way high. So a lot of times you'll see when we get patients transferred to us uh, from an outside hospital, they'll say, you know, we have this patient, they're in cardiogenic shock, we really need your assistance. They're, they're on just tons of levothet, vasopressin, you know, uh, and of butamine, and we really need some assistance, you know, driving them. Uh, we're not, they're not making urine, uh, they send them over to us. 
one of the first things that you'll see us do is pull up pressors in that patient. And that's because we're recognizing this equation that overall, my big problem is my systemic vascular resistance is really high. Um, if you think about going to the gym, I, I tell patients that, you know, say you take uh, someone who is a really strong guy and then someone who's maybe not as strong. Your strong guy is maybe your normal hyperdynamic heart. Your guy who's not as strong is maybe your heart that's weaker. So you reduce the F. And then you tell them, like, I want you to go bench press. And you get someone who's not that strong, you give them 315, you put it on the bar. They have no capability of lifting that. You start reducing the weight, you bring it down to 225, 135, 95, and then now they can lift that weight. This is the exact same weight. Your heart is just a muscle. Sometimes your hearts are really hyperdynamic and moving and strong, and they can handle that increased systemic vascular resistance. I imagine anyone on this call, if we jacked up your systemic vascular resistance, your cardiac output would be able to deal with it. In our patients, they can't. So now, think of it that way. Now you have this heart working against tons and tons of weight, the systemic vascular resistance that's high. And so then that's why we're going to go through and address what are the interventions that I can do to help with cardiac action. So now we'll give you two types of patients. So patient one uh, comes in, both patients come in the cath lab. Those patients are 60 year old. Both patients are in acute respiratory distress and you're having difficulty diaries. You send them to the cath lab because you want to write heart cath. Patient A, you know, I'll show you here. So we're going to tackle both these patients slightly different. So patient A comes in, their blood pressure is 140. 90, which would give you a map around 100 to 10, something like that. Um, their cardiac index is, let's say, 1.6. You get the second patient that comes in, blood pressure is 80, 50, giving them a map, let's say, around 55 to 60. Their cardiac index is also 1.6. So, the reason I like to spend a little more time on cardiogenic is because there's really two big ways that we handle it. So the first thing I do, I get that patient that's coming in and I'm pretty sure this is a cardiac shot. I've gone through my algorithm in my mind. I think this is because of the heart. The next thing I do is figure out, well, what am I gonna do? We've already identified that heart rate, we're not really touching. Pretty well, we know they're in a high state. Contractility is way down. Systemic vascular system is very, very up in some of these patients. So patient A, so I got a lot of blood pressure in there. I have a map that's probably 120, 115, something. And so what are my options to deal with this patient? Well, you look at both patients and I know that I need to get preload off. Of them. So both of them are gonna get diuretics. That's an easy one for us. So first step for us is gonna be diuretic on these patients. This patient, patient A, however, they've got a ton of blood pressure. And one thing I learned from Jen Cook and actually Jeff Weiss says this too, is if you think about cardiogenic shock, think about it like monopoly. And all of your medications and interventions require a certain amount of monopoly money. And how much money you start with is based on your math. We love seeing patients who are warm and wet, who've got a, a good mean arterial pressure and a lot of fluid in their index is low, because those are patients that are a lot easier for us to rescue. So with this patient on top, I have a lot of options and I have them mainly in the effect of after load reduction. So, I'm looking at afterload reduction. So we can put them on inotri or we can put them on uh, direct drips such as nitri, nitro, IV hydralazine. Uh, uh, additionally, we have oral agents, uh, isodyl hydral, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, and uh, interesting now. So this patient here who's got a really <laughs> high map, that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge them with nitri or nitro drip. I, I card in here and see if I can get them down. If I bring their systemic vascular resistance, this person probably has an SVR calculated somewhere around 3,200. That's them bench pressing 315 pounds. If I can bring that down to in the 100 pound range, you know, that systemic vascular resistance 800 to 1,000, which I can with that, you're going to see that the cardiac index go up dramatically. So I want to bring them down to a map goal around 60 to 70. That's our map goal for so I have a lot of tools for that patient. And then additionally, say I try after one of them and say I turn them into patient B or patient B comes in now. So here's the difference. So we talk about math being our monopoly money. We had a ton of money with the patient A. Patient B, I don't have much. 
uh, patient beast coming in where at the point where I have nowhere to go to have to look at these things. They're probably seeing, they're both seeing end organ perfusion uh, dysfunction because it affects us so well. But this patient, if I were to try any apple reduction on them, with the mapping where it's at, they're going to see worse end organ perfusion. So those are the patients that I go to inotropes. So, so really, I know cardiogenic shock, people think inotropes is the most important step. Really not. The most important step is actually seeing if I have the room to apple or reduce this patient. Because then I can really keep them off of being on uh, inotropes and they're going to do a lot better. This patient, I don't have that option now. So I know this patient, they don't have a ton of SVR. Um, and because their cardiac output is so poor, we're seeing that reflected in the index of that. Because we know that that's why the math is so bad. So with them, you know, now you're taking someone who's very weak and still, even with the weight reduced to as much as we can, is still having a hard time lifting. So those are the patients that you need to really augment their contractility. So instead of tack tackling the SVR here, I'm going to tackle the contractility instead. And then I probably got another, you know, five minutes or so. So let's just touch on the two inotropes to view the Adorno and why we choose them. And it's pretty simple for me, but you may see, and you know, I, I remember at one of the residences at ASU said, like, you know, it, it just seems like you guys alternate, or I can't really figure out why I used a view and why I used Dorna. And uh, there's a couple of different scenarios where I like them specifically. So, Dibutamine, the big advantage for me for Dibutamine is it acts rapidly. So, if patient A comes in and they're crashing, they look pretty bad, and I need to know that I need to get back. Perfusing better right away, I'm going to elect a view for that patient. Additionally, it has a little less uh, effect of, on systemic vascular resistance than Miller known does. So, Miller known in patients uh, such as patient B here, I may not be confident that uh, even though I'm giving them more inotropy, that my net effect might be actually still having the same amount of end organ perfusion dysfunction because I don't know that their map can handle it more. So in a patient like that, I'll go with the DNA. So it works faster. Um, I can use it in patients who have lower maps where I'm not worried about dropping them more. Um, so then it sounds like a great job. Well, what are the reasons I don't use it? There's one big reason, and that's uh, arrhythmic. It's very arrhythmogenic. Now, melanin is too. Melanin can generate bad rhythms, both atrial and ventricular. But the butamine has the worst effect. And so say this patient, patient B, Say they came in and they had uh, uh, a big uh, end STEMI, and now I see that they've got triple vessel disease, and you know, they need to go to bypass, and they came in with a VF arrest. And this is a patient that I need to weather until they can get their bypass. Well, they're a non revascularized and they had a VF arrest. So the butamine is not the medication I would pick for that patient. I have a hard time fitting them to that. Um, so that's one of the big reasons why. Well, the estimate of the mutant is in a patient who, one, develops really bad, hard to control atrial rhythms, or has a history of ventricular rhythms, and they weren't revascularized. It's a big no-no for the mutant. Now, melanin, on the other hand, melanin has a lot of advantages, and it does have some disadvantages. The big one we talked about was timing. So this patient, patient B, may not have that much time. And melanin, the onset, it takes at least four hours in general for me to see the really true onset of the melanin. So I know if I don't have the time, then that's going to be a limitation for melanin. The other limitation for it is the kidneys. Uh, if someone has uh, poor uh, renal perfusion already, and we see it a lot in these cardiogenic patients, if I see their creatinine going up, I know that I'm going to be really uh, handicapped for using melanin. Um, I think the actual heart cutoff is the creatinine of three, but if I start seeing an escalation of creatinine from two to two, two to two, five, and I think it's going to go in that direction, then I'll already make the jump off of melanin to the VMA um, organ So that's one of the big limitations. One of the things that you'll hear, and there's not a really good consensus on this, and I've asked multiple attendees, and I've gotten multiple different answers, is melanin usage in CRT, especially in the ICU. Um, I've used that personally. I don't. I don't like it. I tend to use the VMV more in those patients or mechanical support because I feel like anecdotally I don't have as much control. Uh, there was a there was a question uh, from somebody. Yeah. Uh, quote: I didn't hear that you use melanin when they have a history of ablation. No, 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 no. 
some Miller node can cause atrial arrhythmias as well too. So if someone had a history of okay, a flood or ablation or something, either one of these is a viable option to use. Um, it's just some people think that the point I'm trying to make is that Miller node still is arrhythmogenic. You know, some people say, oh well, they have this going on instead of the DMV, we'll switch to the Miller node. So they have atrial tachycardia. I'm going to switch it from Davidami to Miller node. You may see less atrial tachycardia with the Miller node, but it's still rhythmogenic, so you can still see it. Um, as far as someone who's been post ablation, there's not a specific one that I would pick. You know, if they're post ventricular ablation and, and they still have a ton of PVCs or something like that, then I would err away from Davidami on that person and use Miller. Uh, so we talked about renal dysfunction being a limitation with Miller node, and we talked about um, Onset of action being a, uh, a barrier, and we also talked about a low start on arterial pressure. The big advantage of melanin is it has a lot of pulmonary vasodilation effect. So, in patients who are fighting against really high PA pressures, uh, it's really nice to actually have that trigger of melanin there. It's kind of a it gives us some inotropy and it helps us with the PA pressures. And you also will see some systemic vascular distance reduction from melanin as well. It has some basic dilatory effects as well. So that's the big advantages of melanin. And then in our realm, which I won't say my realm because I, I have no desire to be a heart failure specialist, but the other thing that we'll use melanin for is patients are a little stable on it when they go in a long term infusion capacity. So if you're thinking about discharging a patient on anatropes, so you've tried everything, you've tried all your absolute reductions, and you still you get them to a perfect wedge and you still can't. Get to the point where you're confident you can take them off of inotropes if they want to go home with them. Those patients do a little bit better on Miller uh, and it's because of the arrhythmias. Patients we sent home on WME uh, have a lot more problems with arrhythmias. So, so that's one other caveat for Miller and we'll use it instead. And then we talked about both of those have limitations. You can't use a Miller you can't use the WME. That's when you call your interventionalist to get. Uh, uh, mechanicals. Uh, and then pressors. So just to briefly touch on pressors. So in the beginning, I mentioned that we'll get a lot of transfers from outside hospitals who will have a patient on, you know, big doses of Levo, big doses of ASO, and then uh, WME as well. And the first thing we do is we just take all the pressors off. There's really very rare situations where we need pressors in patients who have cardiogenic shock. It's generally always when they have a mixed shock. In mixed shock, you got to think through a little more differently. So if you have someone who's septic and cardiogenic, you may need pressors. But for pure cardiogenic shock, it's going to be a very rare situation where you never want to use pressors. So if you have a patient who you think is a pure cardiogenic shock and there are a ton of agents, both inotropes and pressors, the first thing we do is tend to peel the pressors down. And that goes back to the SBR to see if we can get that under control and see if we can get their heart working more efficiently. Basically, yeah. Um, if you guys have any questions, happy to attempt to answer them. If you guys want to either verbally ask your questions, we can hear them, or if you want to take them into the thing, I'll read them out loud for uh, for Chris. We'll wait while you guys are typing. Sure. <laughs> Um, one thing that popped up was uh, Derek was reviewing the SVR calculation. Are you able to kind of go over, I guess, the definition of cardiogenic shock? There's and like how we calculate an index sure, and sure. how we calculate so, SVR. SVR. The way you calculate it. So, so, so if you just look simply here, mean arterial pressure plus cardiac output times SVR. So if you just go by uh, your algebra, you can get to uh, mean arterial pressure. Divided by the cardiac output equals the systemic vascular resistance. I think probably what they're referring to is specifically the, uh, the Dines units or yes. that we use for it. Um, so I'm probably going to get this wrong. But uh, so, mean arterial pressure, say, say you have a map of, I don't know, say you have a map of 100 and you have a, a cardiac output of one, which this would be really abysmal. Um, so you know that your SVR then uh, equals 100, but then to get it to Dines unit, I think the multiplier is 80 for that, mm -hmm. which would give you an 8,000, which is insane. Like you guys know, you've never seen one that high. Um, generally, if you're, if you're talking pure numbers wise, Dines unit, um, I really don't like patients higher 
than certainly 15 to 1600. Um, I don't know that there's a specific number that you can make a diagnosis of cardiogenic shock based off of because there's a lot of things that could check on your SPR. Um, but if they're higher than 15, 1600, I'm going to want to have to reduce them. Generally, a sweet spot for these patients is right around 1,000, give or take 200. So 800 to 1200 is where I want to get them to, where they're going to do this. We'll see dying to the levels of two to 3,000 quite frequently. I mean, this is a pretty extreme example. Uh, and I, it's either 80 or 88. I know Patricia's probably yelling at me, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's 80. Um, we have a few questions. I'll, I'll kind of read them out as, uh, as they come in. One that kind of corresponds to this is, what do you follow more, cardiac output or cardiac index? Index, for sure. Great question. Um, and, and that's just because output, I mean, I mean, it's so variable based on a body surface area. So, for instance, we had a, we had a guy in the unit uh, a month ago or two months ago when I was in there who was 380 pounds, um, and he needed an ECMO flow of six liters just to maintain a cardiac index of uh, a two, because his PSA was three. So I really don't like output. I don't really use it that much. The index is much more usable because I, I care what the blood flow they're getting in relation to their body surface area, because it all comes down to end organ dysfunction. And even if I have this great booming output, but you have this huge patient, well, I know I'm not getting adequate tissue perfusion with the organ. So, so I definitely would stick with index. So, and the index values that we like. So, so I always tell patients the bare minimum index. So if you're sleeping, the bare minimum index I want them at is two. And a lot of times people get fixated on that number of two and think, oh, okay, well, my index is two, I'm doing all right. That's not the case at all. So, for instance, we had a patient, a young female, who was a postpartum cardiopathy, and we got her dialed in as best that I could. She had a really dilated left ventricle, and so we got her to a wedge of 16 to 18, which is ideal for her ventricle size. And we had her afterload down to 800 to 1,000, and uh, we had her on good doses of Entresto as well as uh, Isoil and nitrates to get her there. Um, and despite all of that, her cardiac index was 2.0. So this is a patient that I have perfectly dialed in who has a bare minimum basal metabolic cardiac index. So that's a patient that we committed them to melanone as a bridge to that. So we, we knew we couldn't send them out without a true. So I, I really like using index. So kind of along the lines of uh, that, uh, when do you think of advanced therapies like LBAT or transplant? Uh, a great question. And I, I go with the, I, some of you have had the pleasure of working with Jen Cook. Some of you haven't gotten a chance yet. Hopefully you all do get to because she's outstanding. And LVADs, um, advanced therapies. So advanced therapies are LVADs and heart transplant. And bridge therapies are, you know, maybe balloons and a valve. And so, so advanced therapies, specifically LVADs and heart transplants, you want to look for end stage heart disease. What, what does end-stage heart disease mean? Because a lot of us think it's, you know, that patient who's, you know, almost a palliative player at that point. And, and that's almost when they're too far gone. So actual end-stage heart disease, so if you've had multiple admissions for heart failure within a year or two-year period, and we're talking two admissions there. So if you get two admissions in a 12-month period for you come to heart failure, that's end-stage heart disease. That's a that's quali qualifier for end-stage heart disease. If you're iotrope dependent, if you're getting to the point now where your MAP is too low and you can't be on goal-directed medical therapy, so so if you get those patients where you know you'll, you'll see them a lot at Oxford in your guys' clinics, is say you have a patient who's on core three one two five, almost seven point two point five, really baby doses, and you're scared of pushing them higher. That's end stage heart disease because they're not capable of you now getting on actual appropriate goal-directed medical therapy amounts. So. Those are the patients, anatrope dependency, frequent admissions for heart failure, have evidence of end organ tissue perfusion. So now if you're starting to see their CKD get worse, and then patients where they don't have a blood pressure room for you to really get them on good doses of beta blocker, ACE, or RNA. Those are the patients that should be considered for LBAD and transplant. And if you think about all the patients that you've seen, that's a lot of patients. So those patients really should be getting referred to advanced heart failure specialists pretty early. Because if you give one of those patients to Jan Cook, she'll get them teed up for a bad or a transplant pretty rapidly and get them working. And uh, you really, the key is, is to get them on an advanced therapy before they don't become a candidate. Because most of the patients that 
and getting referred to them, it's too late to the point where they developed end stage renal disease, or now they have pulmonary pressures that put them outside of the range of being community. So that's that's really when I think about that. And our transplant is actually much earlier than most people do. Let's see, I like this question. Can we talk about swans and interpretation of swan numbers and how that oh, choice? Okay. Yeah. Affects up titration of milanon. That's, that's uh, what was the last part. Oh, titration. just how does it affect our titration of milanon or choosing oh, okay. milanon versus dobutamine? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I can give, we can give a whole talk on pH catheter <laughs> numbers. So we'll we'll give it very quickly. So your pH catheter numbers, you get a couple things. So RA, RV, PA pressures, your wedge pressure, and then you get your both thick and thermo. Uh, I'll put it in there. So what you have to do is put all that together. So we'll go back to that example of that postpartum patient that I had. So you had a patient that was on 0.25 of milligram, uh, 250 micrograms more. And so her numbers, I'm just pulling them off the top of my head. So her PA, let's say, were somewhere around, uh, she was 55 over 20 or something with a wedge of 16. And her mean PA pressure was somewhere around 30, let's say. So so there you've got someone who has elevated PA pressures. Uh, her RA, let's say, was you know, anywhere from five to ten doesn't matter. And then her wedge, we said, was 60. And then her index was 2.0. So let's write those out real quick. So I'll forget. Them. So so let's say her CVP will give her a 10. Uh, PA will give her 50 over 20 with a mean of 30. And then wedge, we're giving her, her MAVI will give her 15. And remember that 15 for her, we thought is her ideal. And then her fit cardiac index was 2.0. And you can use thick growth thermo. Uh, that's another separate lecture on when one's more reliable than the other. So, so looking at these numbers, so this was uh, in a patient who's on melanone. She was on melanone at 0 0.2. So then this is a patient who's on melanone. And like I said, I look at my wedge in this patient and I look at my uh, index. And then I'll touch briefly on what the PA pressure is significant. So in regards to titrating melanin, she has a big dilated left ventricle. And so I know I want her wedge somewhere 16, maybe 18. I know that's going to give her the most optimum preload to get her the best contract contractility I can. So I've dialed in on her wedge. Additionally, I, you know, being that her wedge is dialed in, this is the best I got her pressures to. I knew that she's in the best spot that I could get her. But her index is still at the bare minimum that I wanted. So this is a patient that I knew that I'm committing her to melanin. I have to send her home on. I can't wean it down anymore. And in fact, I increased her melanin to 0.375 because I knew I was sending her out on it and a 2.0 index for her was too low. So that combination of where am I at with their wedge and where am I at with their index is going to help drive if I increase or decrease their inotropes. Ultimately, we always hope we can decrease the inotropes, get them off of it, and get them on the actual medical therapy improve their heart function, but uh, if we can't get there in a scenario like this, then I will increase the anatomics. And then briefly touching on her, the reason why her PA pressures are important for her is since she's a young patient, this is someone we would have taken directly to transplant, but her mean PA pressure was somewhere around 30 with her wedge of 15 or so. And so that gave her a transplant rate that was too high to attract transplant. That's why we ended up taking her. Let's see. Um... Does management change for cardiogenic shock due to valvular disease in terms of inotropic thyroid use? So in terms of which specific inotrope it does not, you know, I won't, I won't favor dobutamine or melanone specifically based on any valvular disease that I can think of, whether that's, you know, mitral or rare stenosis versus severe regurgitation. However, anytime that you have severe valvular disease, those patients, you can attempt to weather them with inotropes, and they may need mechanical support to bridge them to an intervention. But a specific heart valvular pathology, I wouldn't pick dibutamine or melanoma based on just the valves. Um, Natalie asked, uh, who gets a cardio MEMS device? So cardio MEMS, so really you want to use it in a patient that's really difficult to get them to a uvulinic state, someone that you're doing frequent right heart catheterization on. And the big thing, so someone who's difficult to keep you able to make and someone who's difficult that you have to do numerous right heart cats. And the big thing that I, I, I left out there is uh, 
their EF. I don't care what their EF is. So, so actually now you're starting to see CardioMEMS devices more in hep, hep patients as well. So the VA is really our bread and butter for the CardioMEMS patients because we have such a hard time uh, gauging where they're at fluid-wise in relation to their exam. So, so perfect example I can use his name because I think he was publicized. Well, I won't use his name because I don't know if he was publicized. But he's one of our recent heart transplant patients. He's a young gentleman. He's 48 years old. He's from the VA. Uh, he had uh, uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. I think it was from anthracycline toxicity, actually, if you know, for, I think it was some sort of blood cell thing uh, when he was young. And uh, we made a transplant. And so for him, when you look at the guy, you know, he, he looks like Gene. He looks great. And But then his, every time I would write our captain, his wedge was, you know, in the 30s, his PA pressure was through the roof in the 70s. And we never knew what to do with him. So that was a guy who we actually were able to bridge him to his transplant with a cardio medicine device. So Dr. Rod put it in, and then he really religiously followed that PA diastolic measurement um, and, and guided his therapy off the PA diastolic and tried to ignore what he physically looked like. And then and the patient did a lot better with that. And we ended up having to put him on pretty big dose diuretics to get there, but uh, he did pretty well with it. So those are the, the times that I think about a MAPS device is uh, having difficulty assessing them uh, physically, um, which makes them get numerous heart attacks and uh, an inability to really, you know, keep the view going. Do you guys have uh, any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. All right. Um, All right. Well, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It was a blast. All right.